Man, I'm having so much fun. This is a $1.6 trillion industry. I'm talking about the food and beverage space. If you're not having fun, you're in the wrong place. Yes, it's hard work, but my gosh, the companies, the brands, the flavors, the experiences, the missions, it's fantastic. But some of the brands are different, better, and special. They're the ones who are able to really compete and buy for customer loyalty. Look, I know you want to make your brand different, better, and special. I know you yourself want to be different, better, and special. That's my mission. That's why you're here. Join me on this journey as I interview CEOs and founders from all the different companies within the food and beverage industry so we can discover what they're doing, so we can take that information back, digest it, and become better ourselves and to help our companies take on different strategies, pick the right technology, pick the right partners. And of course, you got to have great taste in food. You got to have great taste in beverages, packaged goods. If it doesn't taste good, you're lost. I'm sorry. You're going to lose millions. If you're new here, take the five episode challenge. Go back, pick out some brands some CEOs, some topics. If you love the content, subscribe. You're going to find it on every podcast platform once or twice a week. But I also publish them on LinkedIn because that's where we kind of hang out. So when you see it on LinkedIn, stop by, make a comment, share it back into your food and beverage network. I would appreciate it. The brands would appreciate it. To all my loyal listeners, thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Thank you for being with me on this journey. Thanks for coming along on this mission for the past two years. If you are considering a strategic job change, message me. Let's have a confidential conversation. If your brand is growing and you need to attract experts, you also need to contact me because I have created a different, better, and special recruiting system. I promise you, no other search firm in America is doing that. Who am I? I'm Tony Moore. I'm an expert food and beverage headhunter, semi-professional podcaster, and I'm here each and every week. Stay tuned for this week's episode. You know, I figured with everything that was going to happen today, there was no way I wanted video. No, I didn't. I didn't mean like record the video. I just wanted to see your smiling face. You don't want to see my smiling face. I don't want you to be distracted by my handsomeness. Oh, wow. That's it. I mean, I am lean. I am mean. I am a fighting machine. I have dropped the weight. I'm on the bike. What are you doing? I've keto? Got, I've got a bike. Yes, I did. Well, I did even more advanced, I guess, than that. But I cut easily 25 pounds. And um, wow, that's great. I got a bike race. I have a bike race actually tomorrow and I am ready to roll, baby. Sweet. How far is it? Um, not that far. It's a it's a metric. It's a metric century. So it's, it's only 60. The 100 milers, uh, they're painful. I don't care how good a shape you're in. The last 20 miles are miserable. Ooh, yeah, that sounds that sounds awful. I don't even like driving 100 miles. No, I know. I know. Well, <laughs> you know what it is? It's just it's sitting in the saddle. We won't go into details. So Pirate just had his birthday, I saw. Yep. Isn't that cute? The cake and everything. He's uh, he's one. What were those little white balls? What was that? That's the frosting, but it's actually made from mashed potatoes. <laughs> so the 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 young lady that does them, Isabella, she, she's like a third generation baker from Mexico, her family, and she decided not to do like traditional cakes and stuff. She wanted to do for pets. So the the food's all edible by humans too, but it's like a peanut butter carrot cake with mashed potato frosting, and like. I mean, I tried some of it. it wasn't it was pretty good? Yeah. <laughs> I had I, to. Uh, yeah. When they say it's you know food grade, you're like, well, let me just. I'm a foodie. I, let me just I try mean, it out. No, it is. It's just it's just the flavor combinations, right? Like, right, right. I mean, you <laughs> not necessarily what you would pair together. Exactly. So what, what what wine did you put with that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, does, does Jim Beam count as wine? <laughs> Well, you know, we do call sweet tea Southern brown wine. That's a, that's that's how oh, we do it here in the South. I, I didn't know um, that. So you've been with my mochi now for what, seven months, six months? Yeah, since March. So whatever that math works out to be. And I haven't talked to you really in depth about the state of food service. I haven't talked to you about anything. I just want to know 
I look, I just want to know how is it going? I know you've you've had some some big big things put in front of you because it's I mean, it's awesome ice cream. It really is. Um, and what a change for you going to sell ice cream for God's sakes from plant-based. So how's it going? Well, what's life like with ice cream, with food service, everything? Yeah. Well, I think when we last talked, you know, we were, I was just getting started with this. I I don't even know if I'd actually started or not. Um, but it's a bit of a departure, you know, my mochi ice cream, bit of a departure from what I've done in the past. Uh, mainly because it's a, more of a retail item versus a back of the house item, right? Where, you know, it's more where I used to be more chef driven and things like that. This is really just a, a, a handheld frozen snack that is really, you know, designed to be purchased from a retail perspective. So, um, you know, we had a daunting task in front of us, but, um, you know, we talked a little bit last time about, uh, about, you know, supporting food service as opposed to kind of limping into food service and kudos to my CEO, Craig Berger and CSO, uh, Sandra Sonnenberg. I mean, they've invested in this business. They've invested in me. They trust me, which is amazing. Uh, they allowed me to hire one of the best teams out there. Um, I brought in a couple of guys from Sambazon actually to help me out too, and including a, a guy that had already been there. And I mean, what we've accomplished in the last three months really has just been unreal. We are launched in 120 colleges nationwide with nationwide distribution. And that's really from zero uh, six, seven months ago. So uh, the, 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 that know, makes the, so much sense. I mean, that to me, that, that would be exactly what a college kid would want. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, it's it's a it's a fun donut ice cream. I mean, don't overthink it, but they they love it. It's just a um, the perfect little pre portioned portable snack. No, I mean, like I say, just don't overthink it. Right? It's a it's a handheld treat. It's delicious, and who I mean, who doesn't want? Is that wait? wait what is the the outer cover? What is that? Like a rice? What is this? It's, yeah, it's it's mochi dough, which is just a sweet rice dough. Sweet rice dough. Yeah, yeah. And it's got and that it's, that powdered it's, sugar. It's, yeah. No, it's dusted in rice flour because mochi dough is really sticky. So we dust it in rice flour on the outside. So that way it's actually, you can actually, you know, put it in your hand. So I'm just curious, how is it being sold when you're at, at the, at, at, on college campus? It's not like the, is it the six pack? I mean, obviously I'm on on college campuses. So what's. Yeah, it's probably been a little while since you've been on college campus. <laughs> like, hey now. Uh, hey <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so predominantly in singles. So we do little single serve units. And uh, what we what we typically do is we provide a bunker style freezer that can, you know, it's branded My Mochi on the outside. And then um, it can hold anywhere from three to five, or if you have a larger one, seven different flavors. And so, yeah, you get a variety of products in there and uh, just the single serves. So it's just a little pre-portioned single serve, one ball at a time. I would imagine that the the challenge is freezer right i i don't know um was that one of the yeah of- yeah it really is i mean you have to find the the one of the big learnings for me was just that like the pos side of it yeah anywhere you go you have to have a way to merchandise the product so uh for instance we launched with hilton homewood suites uh nationwide and we provided them with a a clear plastic merchandiser with our with our brand on the front that they can put into the little micro market freezers that they have at each hotel Um, or at a college campus, we have to provide a bunker freezer, or if they want to put us into their own vertical freezers. So, you know, most of the time we're in a convenience store on campus. So, um, they still have the vertical freezers. We do sell six packs in the vertical freezers. The students love to grab the six pack and then take it with them back to their dorm or whatever and share it with their friends. Uh, but I always joke, like, I don't know why we make singles because I just eat a whole six pack, right? What's really funny and one of the big challenges we have is that from a distribution standpoint, it's not geared towards the people that run distribution. Um, and you can read between the lines on that. But from an age standpoint, it's really not geared. to. So so when we send samples to somebody who's a distributor and they try it, they're like, oh, it's kind of odd. It's weird. The dough and the ice cream, I don't get it. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's really not for you. Right. It's for you. Oh, my God. Consumer. That's like this. That's like the biggest issue, even with investors. You're trying to sell something and it's like, hey, you can try the product, but you're not going to like it. It's not your it's not for you. Yeah. And some people just can't get out of their own way. So that, that's exactly. a big challenge. And, and, you know, as far as the state of the food service business, man, I mean, a lot has changed, obviously, since the pandemic. And it's 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 tough. Um, I mean, what's we tough? Were, Honestly, what is just, what's just, what seems just, to be the big it's problem. The distribution side of it? Um. I think, you know, a lot of the broadliners 
got burned when the pandemic hit. You know, they got stuck with a lot of product that they didn't want. Was that pirate? Couldn't. That was pirate. Yeah. Which is, is he you know, not? No, listen, he's already had his birthday. Like, he's had I'm all like his pirate. The light is on. I'm on the exactly. Air, this is this is Come it. On. We're going live. <laughs> Ah, the joys of working from home, but uh, which is which is awesome. But no, so the distribution piece of it, the challenges that broadliners faced. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to bringing in new product, even when you've got an operator saying, "Hey, I want it, I want it." Um, we know they want it. We've put freezers in there in the uh, in the college campus, and the distributors are still like, "Ah, uh, you know, we still might not bring it in." And it's like, wow. So we spent the better part of the last two months working with uh, some partners and, and Vistar was actually one of them from the vending side. They, they've been a great partner. Um, we were able to get nationwide distribution with them and all 23 opcos and they're supplying all of these colleges and it's just been phenomenal. But without that piece, I mean, without the distribution piece of it, you're dead in the water and it's been, it's really challenging. And I know just from speaking to other colleagues around the country, that distribution still is just a really, really big challenge, especially getting new distribution. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned getting all the the freezers and the bunkers. I mean, you make this huge capex, right? And now you're expecting to have the operators go into their distributor and I guess what, open up the the portal and say, "This is what I want. Let's get these freezers loaded." And eh. yeah, and it's like a it's like a it's like a circular loop thing where it's like um, well, we can't see it in the distributor because it's they haven't or the distributor hasn't ordered it yet. But the distributor won't order it because the operator isn't ordering it. But the operator can't order it because they can't because they're see not it. seeing it. And it's just like, I was like I was beating <laughs> my head up against the wall for like a couple of weeks trying to figure this thing out. And it's just like it's like the most complicated chess match I've ever played in food service between managing the account, the operator, getting them a freezer, um, making sure the distributor could buy the product, but putting trust in us that the operator actually wants it, even though they can't see that they want it. And it's just, I mean, it's just really complicated, uh, but we ended up getting it, getting it done. Well, Alex, I mean, I, I've definitely have heard from other, you know, broadliners, the term guarantee, you know, have you thought about that? Oh, we do it, but they still, it's, <laughs> we tell them, look, the product's guaranteed. Don't worry, but they're still really gun shy. And, and what we always hear too is, Oh, we don't have freezer space. I'm like, we'll build a bigger freezer. Come on. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like, or there's got to be a lot of stock in there that's not moving, right? So it's like, well, get rid of the stuff that doesn't move. My stuff's going to move, man. My mochi is like hot. Everybody wants it. So it's like, make room for it and let's go. But, um, you know, so we, we've, we've, for the most part, we've been able to overcome that now. Uh, but it was really challenging for a couple months there. My biggest fear was, look, I've got 180, 200 freezers out there and they're all sitting there empty for like a month, you know, not generating any revenue. Well, you know, that's that's kind of a that's kind of a, a heart attack there for me. So we've got <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, you're you're brought in to, to build food service and it's like, well, I, we've got these beautiful cases. Yeah. I mean, I sold a bunch of I gave away a bunch of freezers. Woohoo. You know, good job. That is <laughs> great. Great. Uh, <laughs> and meanwhile, my company's going to be like, on the so, P side of so the we just shipped all these freezers out, but we don't see any orders coming in right so but uh it's got to be frustrating when you don't have any control right and they, that's what you're talking about and i've listened i've heard other big companies that they've decided to what's it called when you just take over distribution yourself like dsd yeah yeah dsd right right yeah. sorry dsd yeah so and, okay what's the pro con there uh well dsd you know you're usually partnering with somebody that that in the ice cream business, the frozen novelty business, there's a bunch of DSDs across the country. And we actually work with a lot of them. Um, and those are mainly going into like convenience stores and things like that. Um, challenge is, is that the, the price point can be a little bit high for what you're looking for. Um, but the, but their service level is really good because they're in the accounts pretty frequently. Right. So, um, so that, that's good, but it, it just tends to be more expensive. Most, you, you don't want to do it on your own, because buying Why? trucks, setting up routes, paying all that. I mean, that's just a, it's a that's huge, right. It's just a single, right. just a single. Right. But, but to that, you know, one of the things I would, I would say I would transition to talking about too, is, is like the broker model. I think we've talked about using brokers before, right? Brokers mm -hmm. that represent your products in different markets and whatnot. And um, the broker models, it's been really challenging as well. Why? Um, I mean, you think that you just, you just incentivize them. I don't, uh, to well, me, I, think I oversimplify I, it. Why not? They know it's going to sell. Why? Yeah, You have to look back a couple of years ago when, when food service was basically shut down 
And a lot of people didn't weather the storm or brokers, you know, maybe they had to let some people go and they just couldn't get them back. Right. And so um, you've got these national brokers and, and they're trying to get back to full, full speed. And um, I think we've actually had more success just doing direct sales with our with our team. Um, and so, yeah, it's just it's just a, it's just a totally different landscape. I was talking to a, a colleague of mine yesterday who's been in the industry for a lot longer than I have. And, um, you know, things have just changed. It's just like the, the things that I used to do with broadliners to, to get products stocked. It's like the whole playbook is just gone now. We've got to start over from scratch. And it's like everybody's trying to trying to figure it out. So I'll give you an example. Like back in the day, Cisco would would say, OK, if you've got, you know, guaranteed five cases per week uh, coming out of our opco, we'll stock the product for you. Well, now it's like, OK, we're showing some cases where we're going to have like 20 to 30 cases a week and they still won't stock the product. Um, so it's just things. Wow, just they've changed. totally raised the minimum. I mean, that's oh, yeah. that's that's insane. That's like four X. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, but it's, but, they didn't, but then they didn't tell anybody. Right. So it's like, we're all, we're all operating under our, our old uh, pretenses of how things work. And we're like, why isn't this working? Are they right? just gun shy? Is that what that is? Is that, is that just yeah. because they, they, they lost who knows how much money they lost? I mean, you also have to look at like the number of new products that are trying to come out there and launch. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of, there's just a lot. And, um, I mean, we yeah, were but they're Nathan. unknown. I mean, what would you rather go with a, a known or an unknown? You're not going right. to go with the unknown. I mean, unless you're getting exactly. some pull from the operator. Well, and, and, but then like, let's talk about the plant-based space a little bit. When I was at NACUFS in Spokane, the national conference, um, we, we partnered with them. We sponsored it, uh, with my mochi, but I, uh, I kind of got a kick out of walking around the actual food show, which we weren't part of, but. Um, there had to be like 10 to 15 plant-based chicken companies. And I'm like, where, where are y'all going to go? You know, like, and, and is Cisco going to bring in all of them? No. Right. Or is us foods going to bring in all of them? No way. And so it's just, there's all this, this, this new stuff coming out, but it's just overcrowding the space. Whereas my mochi we're, I mean, we're a pretty unique item, but, but it's, it's a little bit odd to people. And they're like, well, where does it really fit in? Is it food service? Is it retail? What is it? Um, so I think that, yeah, they're just a little bit gun shy, especially with new items that are unproven in that, in that segment for us, fortunately, we, you know, we've been proven in the retail space for a long time. I mean, we're nationwide, I think 80 to 90% ACV. We were the number one selling uh, frozen novelty at target for a while, uh, last year. So we've got pretty good brand awareness, but still we were unknown in the food service side. So there's got to be a little bit of uh, trepidation on the, on the distributor's part to bring in something new. Yeah. But we've talked about this before. You have, you've been a proponent of saying start in food service. Yeah, absolutely. I, right. I like start in food service and then transition to retail. Well, you've already got the retail footprint. You've already got the data. What am I missing? I mean, to me, that's the data. Look, if you if you figure it out, can you you can if you can figure it out and let me know, I would love that. I mean, I've talked to people and I'll send them samples and they'll say, "Oh yeah, my kids love these." Yeah, not sure we're going to bring it in. Wait, what? Like, you know, okay, we yeah, you know, but like, we're selling them to kids. Sorry, college age students, we're calling you kids. No, exactly. It's just it's um yeah, it's just it's just a new landscape. Um, you know, it's just uh, yeah, it's been it's been quite an interesting couple of months. You are doing it a little bit in reverse. I guess it is a novelty. Well, and and remember that food service people. So when you look at data from retail, they get really good, rich data. They get IRI data, spins reports, things like right. that. And you can get down to the store level and shopper insights and all that kind of stuff. And fortunately, I've, I've done that in my past life. And so I understand it. But when you walk into a food service account and you show them that, they have no idea what it is. Their eyes are crossed, right? They, yeah, they're not they, used they to seeing that. Yeah, yeah, they just exactly. don't do it, right? They don't, right. They, they, don't, they don't have to, they don't read that kind of data. So you can show it to them all you want. It um, just doesn't resonate. No, but it goes back to, I think, I think our first podcast, when I talked about being effective in food service, you need to have like your sales rep in the meeting, the operator decision maker in the meeting. If you have a broker, they need to be in the meeting and the distributor rep in the meeting all at the same time. So everybody like sits around the table, holds hands and says, yeah, we're going to do this. All right, everybody, we're going to do this together. Let's go. Um, and so that's really what's necessary. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just, uh, you know, like I said, things have changed a little bit. This is a, a helpful, a helpful podcast for people who are trying to understand how does how to sell how to market something that is what not mainstream 
Right. Yeah. Not mainstream. And really, I think the challenge in the food service area for a product like ours is that it really is a retail product. So most of the time, my relationships at, say, a college would be with the chef, the executive chef, right? But they're not really the person I want to talk to anymore about this product necessarily, because I want to talk to the person who's running retail. And so it's a little bit of a, it's a, little bit of a different product in that, in that sense. One of my strengths, one of my weaknesses is I just oversimplify it. And I would just, I would just be spending so much time with those operators that they're, that they're doing the work for you. They're calling the distributor and saying, we want this. And maybe it's also which operators have a, a greater pull with certain distributors. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, it, it used to be that way. Um, but I think what we what we see at the operator level, and I, and I always have to uh, remind my sales team this when they get a little bit frustrated, if something's not moving from the operator standpoint, they're still feeling the crunch of this, uh, of the labor market being down. They, I was talking to uh, Chef Matthew Thompson at Harvest Table Culinary Group, a division of Aramark, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago. And he's like, you know, I've got four stations at the college that need to have four different menu items and I've got one chef. I can't I can't fill the other three stop the other three slots. And my point is is that trying to ask the operator to do these things and try to help you, they just don't have time. Right? Mm-hmm. They've got to keep the lights on and get the doors open and and keep things moving and it, you know, we try to make it as easy as possible for them, but if you rely on them to have to constantly pester the distributor and whatnot, then sometimes it just doesn't get done and and I don't blame them. You know, at the end of the day, my mochi is a great product, but, you know, they've got to make sure they've got chicken available for the students. Right. Or whatever, you know, French fries. Right. So. Um, so, yeah, it's it's um, it's interesting to see that dynamic. Um, but like I said, I remind my team members, I'm like, be patient, especially with the operators. They're really they're really stressed. There's not a lot of help. There's not a lot of labor out there. Um, we're still seeing the effects of the pandemic. Well, let's talk about new flavors. Are there any new flavors on the horizon? We, we have a couple of really cool things going on. Um, in fact, a couple months ago, we were up in, in, in uh, Vernon at our, at our manufacturing facility and our lab and everything else. And I, I kind of liken it to Willy Wonka, right? Like there's like, it's kind of like we make dough on one side, ice cream on the other side, and then like the Oompa Loompas put it together. Um, but we, we sat in the tasting <laughs> lab and we tried like every single flavor that we have or will will have. And of course, everybody else is taking like little samples. I was eating the whole thing. You're just... I had like 30 mochi like, balls. <laughs> <laughs> and we... Um, we have a new. Um, well, you're new, you know. Probably yeah. th- four years from now, you'll be just doing the little nibbles. No, I don't think so. I love ice cream. So, I do too. It's um, like my favorite. It's, it's like it's that amazing. and cake. That and so cake. We're doing a um, we're doing a strawberry boba flavor, which is coming out. Um, we've we've looked at doing. Um, well, we're doing ube, right? Which is like what's the that? Purple, it's like the purple sweet potato from Japan. It's like a sweet. It, look. These are so you I and I are you. not the you we're not the target for this, Tony. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm like <laughs> exactly. you just lost me on that. Yeah, one. exactly. When they told me Ube, I was like, I did the exact same thing. I go, I think I know what that is. Um, but it's a really good flavor. We looked at doing churro. Um in fact oh, they had a pint gosh, of, churro. Well, they had a pint of churro ice cream. I think I ate half of it. Right. Now that still, is that's delicious. money. But then um we're well, also coming where's out. Where's the with blueberry? This, no, we're not doing blueberry. God, I, what I, is it with you guys and blueberries? I don't know, man. It's just, uh, I just don't think it's, uh, it's, it's, just, it's not it's, in the cards. It's not in the cards, but I will say this. Um, and we announced it, I think at Expo West, we had a press release and now we're actually gaining distribution on it in retail. We're doing our smoothie and credit bites. So imagine taking the same format of dough with the filling in it, but instead of ice cream, we're doing a smoothie on the inside. So it's, it's for me, it's pretty neat. I think, Um, you know, kids in the morning, if you can give them this pre-portioned snack for breakfast, but it's actually healthy and it has like, it's basically a a fortified smoothie just wrapped in dough. And it's, it's going to be I think it's going to be a huge hit. I just tried, like we have a strawberry banana one. Um, it's just, it's phenomenal product. That is pretty cool. How is it delivered? What's the packaging look like on that? Same. So in retail, it'll be the same thing. It'll be in a six pack, just like you see our, our, our other ones. So it's all made the exact same way, but instead of putting ice cream in the middle, we're putting a smoothie. Man, that is cool. Yeah. I wonder if you did the adult version with kale. No, (laughs) ew. That that sounds real bad. (laughs) I'm going to, I'm going to make a note not to put you into our R and D. (laughs) 
Imagine doing something like uh, like for the theater with like movie theater butter or something like that. Oh, <laughs> buttered popcorn, uh, licorice. No, no. Oh, like no. the red licorice. I I, I, I maybe really that black maybe licorice that. And I was like, no. I like the churro. I think the churro. I'm gonna. I, you know, how many times have I asked you for samples? I haven't gotten a single sample, and I ask all that everyone else sends me samples. I I don't ever recall you asking oh, because you told I've me that asked. you already buy it from the store. I do, I do, but who doesn't like free? Well, I think I think I can probably say churro. That. The churro know, would be. I got, I got. I I know somebody. I got a. Guy. You know somebody. I think the churros sound. They sound good, and um, what else? Let's see. What else? What else is going on with you? You've. Well, we can we can switch gears a little bit. Um, people, it was funny, you know how people stalk your LinkedIn and everything, right? And well, they saw maybe not yours, my, mine. You. you know what? I don't appreciate that. <laughs> that was such a backhanded. <laughs> wow. Hey man, one he, talk, so he says, "Wow, college for you." I don't even know if you can remember. We haven't, we haven't talked in a while. I've got to get my digs Jeez. in a little bit. Okay, um, what? So but, you, um, but but so I, I put a post on LinkedIn where I I accepted a uh, an advisory board position with a company, and I put yeah, it. On I there. know that company and, quite well. I know you do, and everybody thought that I left my mochi and they were like all reaching out to me and i'm like no congratulations just, yeah and it's so funny because it's like well you obviously just looked at this post and didn't actually read anything that was going on right it was just you just that, saw the logo congratulations right but it's with uh with impasta the already spaghetti folks and um so yeah so that that's that's new and exciting and just uh advising them and hopefully getting an upcycled spaghetti squash into uh, helping them help, you know, navigate the, the food service waters, which, you know, we've been talking about. Well, I thought they were already were in with one of the big uh, meal, meal kits. They are, they're doing a lot with meal kits right now. Um, but, but getting into the non-commercial space, which is where I hang out a lot. Yeah. Right? Which is, mm-hmm. yeah college and university, BNI, healthcare, those sorts of things. Um, and this product, that product will go, absolutely perfect at college campuses upcycled spaghetti squash it's on it's you know sustainability um they're not wasting food i mean they they, they check to, so many boxes yeah i mean you know when you when you talk to uh to, to peter and Danya, i mean yeah they used to throw away millions of pounds of spaghetti squash because it had a scar on the outside and kroger because retailers it. wouldn't take it you, i'm like wow that's how just are ridiculous. we gonna change you know what to me that seems like just a a huge marketplace Right there. I mean, there's what misfits and all the others that are. Yeah, yeah, I think it's called know, what, uh, imperfect foods or something. Yeah, like imperfect that. foods. Why? Um, it's the consumer, right? I mean, we've gotten so bougie. It's like we won't even look at it if it's got a lump on it. Well, no, I think, and I think you and I have talked about this before. Like when I go to the farmers market, and the the apple guy has to put a sign up that says these apples aren't dirty. This is what they actually look like. They're not waxed and shipped in from South America, and they haven't been sitting in storage for eighteen months. <laughs> exactly, but uh, that's just the the American consumer, right? I mean, we're just unfortunately they're just not very well educated about food. Um, I, I think particularly, when, when, particularly fruit and vegetables. Yeah. And I think when you, when you talk about, when I talk about things like this, it just blows people away. And I think people really want to do more. I just don't think they know how necessarily. And it's, you know, we don't promote that kind of stuff, right? We don't really talk about it enough. That goes back to your point, why that's going to be so big on college campuses, because what consumers want, what, what con- kids, consumers, whatever you want to call it, the, the upcoming generation, they want it to be easy. So here you got a company with a great mission and all they have to do is buy the product and now they're contributing to it. Exactly. You know, 100%. And that's actually part of the success with my mochi is that we're in single serve convenience because the students just want to grab one and go. They don't want to, you know, wait around for anything. It's just it's just like immediate gratification. Those uh what wait, how are they getting those single serve? I can't I'm trying to imagine this is not a video podcast. I'm trying to imagine they're not just all thrown in a freezer. No, no, no. So imagine imagine our six packs, Tony. Yeah. And just cut the packaging into six different individual cups. Got it. And seal Got the it. top. Yep. Just like okay, listen, I know you've been I, I know you guys talk about packaging and all this kind of stuff. When are we going to get to the point when we we have better sustainability with with packaging? When it becomes economically viable. Um, kudos to Samazon, my former company, 
I think they just did a release where I, 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 I yeah, I saw I, that. I probably will misquote, but I think it's 2025. They want to be in 100% sustainable packaging, and they've already yep. done that. They have a plant fiber bowl that they use for their ready to eat bowls. Yep, and they're um, using those at the at uh, I think that was at the Giant Stadium out in San Francisco. I think where they yes. they, they debuted that. Yeah, I mean, it's just like you know, I go back to the old you know the old recycling adage. It's like you can throw your Tide bottle in the recycling bin, but it doesn't get recycled because it's not economically viable to recycle them yet. Nobody can make money at it, right? So I think the- I tell you who's making money at it is the recyclers. You pay how much to get your stuff recycled and it's not recycled. Yeah, exactly. Right. Sorry, but that's a, to me, that's a scam. No, it's, it's true. But, um, but, you know, the consumer has to be willing to pay more for it. I go back to um, when Kelly Slater came out, you know, the surfer, when he came out with his outer known brand, but he was dedicated to making all of his clothing 100% sustainable. So he went all over the world and made sure there was no child labor. Well, consequently, his t-shirts are like 80 to to $100. And people Jeez. were like, oh, Kelly's just trying to make money off of us. And it's like, no, this is what it costs to do things the right way. People have no idea, do they? They don't. We well, I mean, we're Americans, right? We just everything's well, just. Well, we uh, listen. <laughs> we ha- we but we are, we are the effect of many years of this kind of globalization, right? And yes, yeah, that's a big that that's a big problem. So, well, which is why I really enjoy working with college students because they're leaving home. They're, they're independent thinkers for the most part, and they're really eager and kudos to that generation. They're really eager to learn. Um, even I would say like my generation, I don't think we ever really thought about these things. Um, and now when you go to a college campus, these students are really well, you know, they have access to more information, right? But they're really seeking to understand more about their food supply chain or where their clothing comes from or where the packaging comes from. They're really eager to learn. And I think that's a, that's a great thing for us. Thaddeus, what, um, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Because I know you do some consulting on the side. Do you? I uh, guess you do consulting on the side, do you? Uh, not so much anymore. Um, Never but mind. I, Scratch I, that. I, no, it's not that. It's just it's more – I actually just really like helping people out. Um, if they have – you know, if, they're, if they really have good products and things like that, um, you know, p- people can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, and just, you know, set, shoot me a private message. And if you're, if you're looking at getting into food service and you need some help, um, especially a lot of retail companies, uh, you know, I can at least try to help, help you a little bit or point you in the right direction or, or introduce you to some people that might be able to help you out. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. I've had a lot of people reach out to me with, with new products. How do they get them going? I'm like, have you listened to the podcast? I mean, just <laughs> that's, hello. That's what we talk about every it's time. It's like every week. <laughs> Here's how you do it. Um, I'm just curious. Are you guys uh, on Amazon DTC or do you, or you don't use that channel? For, uh, uh, we much? are, but that's not I, – I, I can't speak intelligently about it. No, I'm I was really just curious. Good. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you guys have – you guys are pretty much covering the game. You've got DTC or e-com, yeah. uh, retail, yep. and now, now food service. Well, yeah. club, mass, everything. Yes, and we're going, uh, we're going international now too. So my mochi is going international. Um, so yeah, we've got we've which got flavors are you going to launch over there? Same ones. Same. Okay. Same. Yep. Yep. Well, I'm going to make my final plug for samples. I'll give you. I'll send you my uh, address here. At some oh, you know point that's because... the problem. You moved. I sent them to your old house. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't buy that at all. Um, well, listen, a totally off the cuff conversation today, Thaddeus, but I've just been wanting to catch up with you. You're my food service go to guy out on the marketplace. I wanted people just to hear the state, you know, the state of food service. I keep hearing it's changed. I think you're living it, you're going through it, but it sounds like you're kind of maybe we'll there is a light at the end of the tunnel, maybe. There, there definitely is. I mean, it's you know, things are improving every day. Uh, supply is improving, um, you know, work is improving, the labor is improving and everything else. But uh, no, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you, Tony. And um, but thanks for having me on today. I really appreciate it. You got it, buddy. You and Pirate, you enjoy that beautiful California lifestyle where you get to just go to grocery stores and pick up pretty much anything you want and cook anything you want. I mean, I wish <laughs> I don't have that. So I'm I'm stuck in meal kit world right now. 
All right. Well, and, and, and also good luck with the uh, race tomorrow. Yes. Thank you. We will see uh, how the legs do. <laughs> All right. How the legs do. All right, Thaddeus. Thank you, sir. Thank you.